Hey, Jim Hoffman here from EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Today's Monday Minutes, I want to quickly go over uh, pediatric shock and just some key points here on how to try to stay ahead of that curve when you're dealing with pediatrics. We all hear how pediatrics can compensate, compensate, and then crash. So I think this presentation, this quick Monday Minutes, will hopefully give you some key points to remember when dealing with pediatrics and thinking about shocks and how they are presenting. So we're all familiar with the compensated, decompensated, uh, or even irreversible shock. And when we talk about this, um, you know, the compensated shock, this is mainly stage, and you're going to have the body is trying to get those, uh, you know, using the, the uh, mechanisms that it has, whether it's hormonal, chemical, uh, physiological mechanisms, to try to reverse the condition. Now, in decompensated or uncompensated shock, you also may even hear this uh, referred to as a progressive type of a shock. This is what's going to happen when you, it can't compensate. The cause of whatever's causing the shock is is not being treated correctly, and then you get it where it's going to proceed to this decompensated stage where all of those those compensation type mechanisms start to fail. So that's the decompensated section to it. Now, when you have, you get to the part of irreversible. Um, also, can be, you might hear hear that referred to as refractory shock. Um, this is a stage it really can't be reversed. This is where you've got the vital organs, they're, they're failing the shock. It can no longer be reversed. You have brain damage or cell death that's starting to occur, and eventually the, the patient will die. You're not going to reverse this form of shock. So we want to try to keep an eye out for the compensated area so that we can try to treat that and prevent it to getting into the decompensated shock there's other classifications of shock as well that we have that we'll see out there. Also, just real quick, just to kind of go over each one quickly for you here. Now, you get the hypovolemic or the hemorrhagic shock. And this is you know a lot of what we'll see, the blood loss, extreme vomiting or, or diarrhea. Um, and this is where we're getting that fluid loss. And, and having issues with uh, uh, circulation. Of course, vomiting and diarrhea is a very big cause of hypovolemic shock in pediatrics. Um, and you also think of things like burns or environmental type of exposure or even things like extreme urine loss from things like diabe diabetic uh, ketoacidosis or things like that. So <clears throat> that will be your hypovolemic or your hemorrhagic type shock. Then you get your cardiogenic shock. And you might not see this as often in children, but this is most often from a, a you know an MI um, and some other causes you might see are things like uh, uh, dysrhythmias or uh, myocarditis or CHF um, things like that or even cardiac valve problems which we might see of course in children some type of uh, uh, genetic type of defect going on there then obstructive shock and this is something where it kind of be also kind of interchanged with cardiogenic but these are things like uh, tension of thorax or cardiac tamponade pulmonary embolism things like that will be your obstructive shock and then we have distributive and this is something we can see in children because you've got things like septic shock is considered to be distributive or anaphylactic shock that allergic reaction uh, type of a shock or even spinal type injury usually higher up in the spinal cord where you're going to have that neurogenic type shock and those are all forms of that dis of that distributive type of shock so what are some of the changes that we might see when it comes to uh, shock. Well, we've got all types of issues with each individual type, cardiogenic or hypovolemic, distributive, um, as far as we were looking at things like our preload, our afterload, things like that. So what do you want to look for when we talk about this? Well, some of the signs and symptoms, just to quickly go over, give you an idea, okay, on each individual area. Now, cardiogenic, you'll get those distended neck veins at JVD because you have that increased jugular pressure going on, weaker and absent pulses. You might have, again, those arrhythmias. Most often, you're gonna, it's going to be tachycardic. And you might get that pulses paradoxes in cases of things like uh, cardiac 
tamponade. Now, in hypovolemic type shock, again, this is that direct loss of that effective circulatory blood volume, uh, either due to blood loss or due to that vomiting and diarrhea. You have the rapid, weak, thready pulse due to, due to that decreased blood flow uh, combined with that tachycardia. You get patients that will have cool, clammy skin because they have that vasoconstriction um, and that simulation of vasoconstriction going on, rapid shallow respiration because of the sympathetic nervous system, um, and even also because of acidosis, thirst and dry mouth, which of course pediatrics, you might not actually get them complaining of that, but that is another thing with hypovolemic uh, type shock. And then you get that cold and mottled skin. And especially that's going to, you're going to see that in extremities of the patient because they've got the insufficient perfusion of the skin. Okay, um, now in distributive type, type of a shock, again, that includes things like your septic shock, and this is where you're having the fever, uh, and that's where the skin might not be cool and clammy like you might see in other forms of shock, but it'll be more warm and sweaty due to the vasal dilation rather than the vasal constriction. Anaphylaxis, with another form of distributive shock, you don't keep in mind. You might see those hives. You might see that localized swelling, that edema, especially around the face uh, and things like that. And you're going to have that weak, rapid pulse. And then keep an eye out for breathing issues. Okay, anaphylaxis, you can get that breathlessness going on because of that narrowing of the airways and swelling of the patient's airway. All right, so when we talk about evaluating um, shock in pediatrics, real quick, again, this is about staying ahead of the curve, guys, right? So, you, of course, regardless of what's going on, whether it's hypovolemic, cardiogenic, whatever, keep in mind, use your ABCs. Assess the patient's airway, their ventilation, and they're going to your circulatory system. Check the patient's respiratory respiratory performance, their rate, the pattern, how often they're breathing, are they having a difficult time breathing, look at their skin color, is it cyanotic, is it flushed, is it pale, uh, if you have O2 saturation capabilities, check that as well, and check the patient's level of consciousness, which can help you kind of discern if the respiratory pattern, the respiratory rate is sufficient enough for them, okay? You know, all the mental status is one of the first things you're going to start seeing when they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, and, of course, circulation, their heart rate, the blood pressure, are they perfusing it? Are they cool, pale, diaphoretic, capillary refill? And, of course, check pulses, uh, you know, distal pulses are important I, you know, to figure out what might be going on with the patient. Now, a little bit more on evaluation. Think about the early signs of shock when it comes to pediatric patients, okay, sinus tachycardia, that delayed capillary refill, and you get the baby or the child might be fussy, appear irritable to you. This is their mental status changes going on, okay? Now, your late signs of shock, you're going to have that bradycardia. The mental status is going to be is further deteriorate where they're going to become lethargic, uh, maybe even be unresponsive. You might have that chin, that chain stokes breathing going on as well. And hypotension in pediatrics is a very late sign in shock, and you don't want to get to that point. So this is why I'm trying to point out some of these key points here to try to keep you ahead of the curve so you don't get to the point of that, that lethargy, that unresponsiveness, or that severe hypotension that becomes a very late sign for the pediatric patient. The lower limit of the systolic blood pressure normally in pediatric patients is usually 70 plus two times that patient's age in years. Now finally, look at the cardiac cardiovascular assessment for pediatric patients in, in shock. Um, your heart rate, if it's, it's going to be too high, which is usually about 180 beats per minute for infants and about 160 beats per minute for children less than, I'm sorry, gr greater than one year of age. Now blood pressure, again, low limit. Systolic blood pressure, 70 plus two times the patient's age in years and check the patient's peripheral pulses. Are they there or are they not there? Are they weak? Is it thready? Okay, think about the strength of it. Is it diminished? Again, weak, thready. Uh, can you feel it's normal? Is it bounding when you're trying to feel the patient's pulse? Look at the skin perfusion, and this is another thing you can you can check out very easily in pediatric patients because sometimes it's hard to evaluate 100% with blood pressure because they are crying, they're moving around. Um, is the capillary refill time, which mentioned already, the patient's temperature, are they cool, are they hot? Um, thinking about things like sepsis, okay, are, are they feverish? Check their color, 
Okay, and that's something again, cool pill diaphoretic. Are they warm? Are they flush versus septic and anaphylaxis versus something like hypovolemic type causes? And the modeling that we mentioned as well. And again, the CNS perfusion or the mental status. Does the pediatric patient recognize their parents? Are they reacting to any kind of painful stimuli? Um, are they flaccid again? Do they have that lethargy going on? And check the pupil size. Is it constricted? Is it dilated and all that? So listen, I hope that this is a quick presentation again, just a few minutes, but I'm hoping that what it's doing is just giving you a quick overview of the signs and symptoms of shock when it comes to a pediatric patient and keeping in mind some of the things that we've talked about as far as their presentation, the different causes, and how to stay ahead of the curve and stay try to treat the patient and recognize what's going on when the patient is still in that compensa compensated phase and not allow them to get to that decompensated phase or worse, the irreversible phase. So that's it for this Monday Minutes at EMS Office Hours. I hope you can use these in your day-to-day -day activities. Um, if you have some minutes of your own, be sure to send them over to me. It's Jay Hoffman at emsofficehours.com. And until next week, as always, stay safe.